All right, good morning and welcome back. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, so let's continue now and try to address some of the questions that we received before about the uh, adoption uh, alternatives or examples that we have prepared. The, the purpose of this section is really to go about how to get started with the uh, with the introduction of the of the OPAS standard. And uh, the agenda that we have prepared is really, you know, divided into three elements, uh, gaining experience with OPAS standard, uh, going about uh, introducing the standards into existing facilities, and then realizing life cycle benefits as an example of, uh, of this uh, introduction. So let's move on uh, with the first part, in, which is getting standard uh, uh, with existing facilities. Uh, as a matter of introduction, what I'll do is I'll cover some of the uh, principles that we have addressed in OPAS and uh, go back about the scope. So uh, from the section before and from the those of you that have seen uh, all uh, documents produced by the forum, you might have been uh, you might have seen these uh, illustration. And you know, essentially, this diagram illustrates the different types of components or products that could be used in, uh, to put together an automation system, and highlight those that are, have been uh, designed to fulfill OPA's requirements uh, in yellow or gold, and differentiates those that you know basically existing automation products that were not designed according to OPA's, and uh, in consequence are not conformant to the standard. On the next slide, I'm going to show you uh, essentially, as we illustrated earlier in the first section, uh, kind of what the forum is concentrated on in terms of the scope of the standard. So, what we're trying to do in the forum is obviously, as we have mentioned, to produce a standard of a standards, OPAS, that is addressing the core automation system infrastructure. Uh, for different reasons, we are excluding certain elements uh, like safety instrument systems, and field devices, or business systems. The, the forum, uh, as we have mentioned, focus on the standards and business practices required to achieve interoperability, modularity, and portability of software and hardware components, and you know that basically comprise the process control layers, right? And um, you know, we cover within the scope then the sections that are typically found on automation system like the control and I.O., PLC, and some advanced controls. So moving to the next slide, uh, I'm, you know, for the, uh, we wanted to, in order to illustrate this transformation, we wanted to, to bring a picture that will be uh, maybe more um, common to many of the uh, users that are participating in uh, in the automation space. So we, we try to depict this same scope. So we kind of reshape some of the um, some of the um, aspects uh, like you know the control and IO boxes, the PLCs, and then uh, you know some networking infrastructure. And essentially, what we're trying to do here is just to to show that. Those elements that we saw earlier in uh, in blue and gold, basically, are now uh, going to be uh, presented in a different way when we, once the transformation starts to happen. So what we're showing really is, you know, in the in, in when we're represented trying to get a handle around this uh, automation system. Using OPAS components, what we're trying the, the idea that I'm trying to present here is how to create this functional parallel between the, the world as we know it uh, today and the world that uh, exists, essentially introducing uh, OPAS conformant products or certified products. So when we talk about today uh, control and IO, either process control or a PLC. In OPUS, we're really uh, seeing a distributed control node or DCN. This might include physical I.O. Uh, that is connected to the field devices and, and F elements and so on. Um, this might host an application. So the applications that we have it today on the PLC might also uh, be uh, uh, hosted by these devices. 
Uh, additionally, uh, let's say we can also host applications on what we call an advanced computing platform. We envision that there will be certain functions that uh, will require, uh, let's say, further um, computing power uh, for some applications, or there might be different ways to deploy automation that will require this uh, advanced computing platform. And then also we'll be able to host applications. But the, uh, in order to connect this together and to really enable the interoperability that we have uh, presented as a core uh, element in, in the vision of the forum, we also need to have this uh, ability to connect all of these devices uh, seamlessly. And that is what we have uh, conceived as the Opus connectivity framework. Uh, I will be elaborating a little more as we go through, but the the idea was to create this, as I mentioned earlier, the parallel between the world as we know it today and the world that we envision can be implemented in, in an automation system using OPA certified products. Now, um, some of the examples that we have, uh, you know, essentially, we have already illustrated some of the experiences of some end users. So as an end user perspective, I'd like to invite um, Jack uh, up here from Shell, my uh, colleague in the business working group, to present uh, some of the challenges in, in these scenarios, right? So Jack, if you might. Jack, are you there? <laughs> I'm here. Okay, uh, now we can I'm hear you. Fighting the system uh, as uh, more of us did. So, so yes, thank you, Luis, and uh, and and I'm happy to be here and and explain uh, our case. Uh, so, as you heard, uh, my name is Jacques Opmeer. I worked in uh, I work in Shell Projects and Technology in the Netherlands, and uh, I have two roles in Shell, uh, all in the same function. But I have a functional role, and I'll have a support role, supporting our, some of our, or most of our assets, to be honest. And, and overall, that uh, comes together in, uh, in, in a program that's called uh, TCS of the Future. Uh, in that, um, I'm uh, responsible for uh, being the liaison of Shell in, in OPAF. And, uh, and the more asset role I have, which I'll, I'll elaborate a bit more on, is uh, on the migration programs we have. So, so in so my, my asset role, uh, I get to see a lot of limitations. Uh, of our current platforms. Um, we struggle, and as Don already said, um, we, we actually would like to see and get more out of our current systems. And the reason is that, you know, over the last decade, uh, these systems moved from uh, uh, adding value, uh, seen as added value uh, equipment, to being a cost element. There was not a lot of extra additional benefits coming from from the systems we use, and and we did see a lot of technology advancements in in other industries, which we wanted to make use of and 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 use. But you know that's uh, that's really a a pain point. So we moved from gain uh, to pain, and and yeah, obviously the systems are still. Are working fine. They give us uh, the the flexibility we all, all always had, but it's not uh, where we want to go. So so that's 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 one of the things I see in my in my asset role. And um, as we see that you know uh, there is also a su a supplier um, challenge. I would say a challenge to you know cope with all the the, the new technologies that uh, are are actually. Uh, being introduced and to introduce them on their on their current platforms because you know that's that's a lot of work. Our current suppliers having proprietary systems, uh, they they cover everything, the whole range from you know the hardware to all the software elements or most of the software elements, and they have to keep up with all those developments which are taking place in all these different uh, spaces. So that's that's a challenge, I think. Our suppliers have, and I'm not sure if we, if they can can actually, uh, you know, uh, cope with the demand we have, because we need new technology to uh, to advance in our business. So, so that's um, 
so so the whole asset space I, I'd like to call uh, industry 3.0 which is clearly automating our plans and and you know as we all know we're at the end of that now the second part of my my role is more a functional role uh, and as a part of that functional role uh, and that was already said I'm co-chair of the business working group uh, and through OPAV and some other platforms we collaborate uh, in we see that there is an enormous potential of new technology uh, or where new technology is a great enabler actually um, it's it's uh, it's looking in the window of a sports car dealer while you, while you drive a mini that's how I try to you know uh, envisage this you drive a mini car and, and you look at this great sports car and um, uh, your car does its job it, it 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 drives you know it brings you from a to b but not necessarily to c so you know uh, that's where i leave this this parallel but you can understand how this feels uh, sometimes so so now looking at our company and it's probably uh, true for many companies we we have two scenarios we have to uh, look at when when we implement new systems and obviously there's uh, a greenfield scenario where you know we build uh, complex uh, you know consisting of many plants uh, or just a, an additional plant or a small chemical uh, facility that's typically what we do or we have a brownfield plant we have an extension um, uh, and and then if we if we look at implementing opus for both of these two scenarios um, there is a commonality um, there is a commonality between those two and that's you know you have to gain experience and and why do you have to gain experience because you know looking at well i take an example if you take the three p's the people procedure and process uh comparisons and what do our people have to learn and and understand before we can implement those systems uh, how do we change our ways of working when we have those systems what can we change to our processes if we have that technology technology available and these capabilities uh, available to us so so there is a lot of learning and understanding you have to do before you you really implement it at for instance a greenfield site uh, which everyone will probably understand so 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 therefore you know i come to to the end of my my uh, introduction i have a question to luis and my question is how do we start how do we how do we gain experience uh, with opas and uh, and luis i hope you can uh, can help uh, me but certainly also all the, uh, the people who are listening in uh, how can you help me with that question how do we gain the experience and how do we start Yes, absolutely, and um, I need to be make the presenter, so I will give you a couple of sketches of what I have in mind, and, and and I can do that in a second. So, all right, so we can start with this, um, you know, vision of the automation system as we know it today, and and the idea, obviously, as you mentioned, you had made uh, an investment, you have uh, your asset is being controlled by these systems today. So, but do you want to, to gain experience? And I think that one example of how to gain experience, how to realize uh, or how to at least test if your, if your benefits, the benefits you anticipate for your production asset can be achieved is by creating some test scenarios and, and putting that into play in a real situation. That real situation doesn't mean that you have to reap your existing automation facility and bringing all new technology that will be an expensive proposition. So what we have seen from the cases presented by uh, Ron and Mohan in the first section, like the ExxonMobil uh, case and the BASF demonstration, are uh, ways in which uh, the user can uh, those users have chosen to to test the the standards and validate the benefits that the standards can deliver to them right so in, in this particular case um, you know the idea will be to to draw in a parallel uh, to the the functionality that exists in the automation system is to create uh, an experimentation area of experimentation that could be considered a pilot, a prototype, or a proof of concept, a test system, a training system, 
in which the, the end user will essentially have the opportunity to experiment. Uh, this doesn't need to be a new process in some of the examples, you know, as we saw it in, in the example of BASF, they created a small process uh, that it was transferring fluids from one vessel to another in a scale situation. In other cases, we can work uh, with simulations. And ultimately, once we, the user has achieved the confidence, the trust on the automation system that uh, using Opus uh, products, then they can transform that to a live process like ExxonMobil uh, already presented in the previous section, right? And so, so there are different ways in, the, in which the user can experiment and test. Uh, these uh, technologies and, and that's kind of what we envision uh, will be some of the, uh, the early adoption cases to, to produce a, a, a test bed or a test system to experiment to try out and, and then uh, moving to um, to a, uh, the a scenario in which now this can be brought into a live process so that's kind of what we anticipate I hope that answers your question. So maybe we uh, move on to, uh, um, I don't know, if, Jack, if you have to want to add uh, some. Uh, I think comments. I think you're answering the question. And I think you're answering the question uh, for a lot of people. That, that there is no way to, uh, if you want to be um, informed, I think there's no way to uh, to just wait and sit back and then things will come at you. You have to start exploring things um, yeah, as well. And, and, and obviously, uh, uh, yeah, you answered that question. I think uh, that's uh, fine. Thank you very much, uh, Luis. One one thing that we we should see, right? So the also the ability to experiment. Uh, you know, we want to highlight the experimentation that uses want and could do around OPAS, but like in the case of BASF, and I'm sure with the case with other end users, the experimentation might extend beyond what has been uh, only covered by OPAS. They might want to try other things that are not necessarily in, in the OPAS scope. Like in the case of BASF, there were other uh, initiatives or industry trends that they wanted to try out. And they did. They try out the modular approach. They try out the the interface to a kind of a business system using the Namora approach. So there is a lot of room for tryouts in this uh, space. So there is a lot of benefit to be get. Now, to summarize this first e example, uh, I kind of wanted to highlight uh, four things. You know, obviously we cover you know the scope of Opus standard. That was what we began with. And then we establish this parallel between the, the existing automation system or the traditional view of an automation system and that uh, the equivalency with OPA certified products, or a rough equivalency, I should say. Then we uh, also, uh, I, I illustrated some of the things that end users want to understand, right? So uh, they want to understand OPAs, they want to see the value that it creates for them, they want to test the capabilities and the, and, and establish anticipated benefits, then they they also want to evaluate and experiment and try out. And that then can store, start small and continue to grow. And this is a trend that we're seeing, you know, it might have been three years ago, it might have been one company. Now we're talking about six or seven companies trying to do this. So the momentum is, as we, get, we see the momentum growing, right? And now the other one is just to, to illustrate the examples, you know, test systems, test bed, training system are all examples of this initial installation. So we have seen those in practice and that have been covered. So with that, let me move on to the next uh, piece and uh, maybe here, um, which I should hand over to, to Dave Emerson and um, or uh, well, Thank I you. actually yeah yeah take it from here. Thank you. Um, this is Dave Emerson with Yogawa, and I'll be talking a little bit about how to um, use OPAS uh, standard with existing facilities. Now uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Julie Smith with Dupont and maybe ask her on. Um, what her thoughts are, and you know, what are the issues with this, or how would we get started? Julie, do you have any questions? Yes, hi Dave, thanks for the opportunity. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. 
Um, as Dave said, I'm here representing DuPont. We are a specialty um, chemicals manufacturer. We may make all sorts of different materials to serve uh, different specialty products industries. Lots of plants around the world, and they run all sorts of different control systems. Uh, part of them. We've pretty much got one of everything. Um, every vendor out there, also every vintage out there. We've got some systems that are very old, you know, maybe installed in the um, late 70s, early 80s, and first generations of systems. We've also got some facilities that were updated recently. Um, you know, we, we haven't sat back and waited. We've started our migration journey at some facilities. Every year there's a new, you know, a, a new migration project that either completes or, or gets kicked off. Um, so one question that, that I have is, you know, for those facilities who have recently gone through a migration project to, you know, whatever the current and generation of, you know, vendor X's system is, um, you know, did, did they, how is this going to impact them? Have, have we missed the boat? You know, do we have to wait another 25, 30 years before we can take advantage of this technology? Because that's how long it's going to take before we do another migration. Um, migrations are very painful, uh, very disruptive to business. There's not a lot of return on that investment. So yeah, it's a you know once every 25 years type of activity. And it would be a shame for us to have to, to have to wait just because you know we're a couple of years late to the party. Um, another challenge we have is a lot of our uh, businesses um, grow incrementally. It's very unusual for us to build a completely new um, greenfield facility where nothing existed before, um, particularly in the U.S. tend to grow incrementally through um, addition of modular process systems. This either could be something um, on the back end, um, you know, safe for um, VOC emissions control, or it can be something on the front end to purify um, materials or utilities. And sometimes it's even smack in the middle of the process. Um, you know, where you need, you know, a higher capacity uh, compressor or turbine or, or, or some other, you know, highly specialized piece of equipment um, to make a new improved rate of product. And integrating those um, package systems has always been a real pain. Um, they typically come with uh, an onboard PLC of, of some sort. Um, you don't really know what's inside the systems. We have to kind of figure it out and then we have to figure out how to tie it into the main control system running the rest of the process. So how can OPF help with the integration of those modular systems? So in summary, my questions um, are two, two part. One, existing facilities, um, you know, how can we take advantage of this technology rather than, you know, wait another 25 years for the next migration project? And two, how can this help with the incremental um, expansions we see with modular process systems? Thank you, Julie. I think you know what you've described um, is a reality for for the majority of um, people and companies in the uh, process industries. And in OPAF, we've looked at this, and I'll try to explain some of the thoughts we have and how um, OPAS can be used with existing facilities, and then especially with the increasing use of module process systems, um, our ideas for how to work that in. Of course, you know, when you describe today, you know, getting started with existing systems, um, in our industry, very rarely is there opportunity to start with a clean slate. Um, of course, they'll come along and they're great, but invariably, whether it's a rip and replace or, or migration upgrade, there's all, a lot of constraints uh, in existing facilities, whether it's floor space, whether it's protocols, whether it's uh, technology. Um, and just operating windows to, to do the upgrades in. There's all types of challenges. Um, to bring OPAS into an existing system, the first step is to establish a gateway. And the gateway we show here is a DCN, and that's really just to show that it could be the same type of box that is a controller. But the key thing is there has to be communications established between the, the future OPAS components and the um, existing control system. Now, OPAS um, is standardizing the 
the OPAS environment per se, and we use the term OCF for OPAS Connectivity Framework. This is really just a logical name for the network for the OPAS systems. So the first step is really to establish an OCF environment inside your plant. And actually just having a, a DCN serve as a gateway. Um, now the protocol it talks to the existing system will depend upon that system, existing systems, capabilities, its age, um, what features it has. So there's many different ways that could be done. On the OCF side, though everything will be standardized. Now, to find this gateway, you're going to, as an end user, you'll have to talk with your suppliers to see, you know, what they're going to offer. Some companies are already laying plans um, to have gateways into um, the OPAS environment, so they'll be able to be hybrid systems, say. Other uh, suppliers may not be that far along. So there, there will be a discussion there. There also may be the possibility that third party suppliers can um, provide gateways into automation systems that the um, automation supplier originally didn't intend. But once this gateway is established, the next step is to add a um, DCN for control purposes. And now this could be any number of types of, of control purposes. It could be just monitoring only. Here we show a DCN with an application running in it. Now this could be an 1131 control engine or, or maybe as Exxon, uh, Don Petusiak, Exxon Mobil noted, they're using the IEC 61499 standard. Or it could be um, even some proprietary function blocks um, that match the original automation system. There's a number of options there. It could also just be used for control, I mean for um, monitoring input only, to monitor parts of the plant with no control, in which case an OPCUA server in this new DCN can be used to broadcast um, or make available measurement data um, either back to the existing automation system through the gateway or an HMI could be put on this gate um, on the OCF or business systems or historians could be um, plugged in here. So there's many different types of ways to, to start from a functionality standpoint with this first DCN. Probably just monitoring only is a safe way to get used to it, add control functionality, maybe add IO to, to actually control a part of the plant. Over time, it's possible then to expand this. And here we show another DCN and, and there's really no hard limit to the number of DCNs that can be on a system. Um, of course, so there'll have to be practicalities as far as network traffic. Um, no network is, is um, all powerful. But there's um, the ability to add the DCNs. And these DCNs can have as much I.O. or as little. They could be um, designed or, or purchased to support field digital networks, or they may just handle you know, traditional you know, twisted pair inputs on analog and um, digital I.O. So there's a lot of flexibility here. Also, what can be added is the Advanced Computing Platform, or ACP. Now, this looks like a big box, but it doesn't have to be. There's no requirement in the standard on how big or small an ACP has to be. Um, in some companies, um, it's envisioned to be a large virtualized um, compute storage and network environment with high availability. But there's also appliances, lower cost appliances, or it could be a, um, a server, um, much like you have in your, in your plants today. Um, I think a great benefit, though, is to run virtual machines inside the ACP. This is a trend that most um, operating companies want to do today and most automation suppliers are supporting. And that way it helps with obsolescence. Um, older operating systems can be run in a newer hardware, a newer hypervisor. Um, we can bring in multiple applications to one hardware platform. So therefore there's just um, all types of savings involved with that that's well known. But again, this, you know, this ACP could be similar to what you have today in your, in your facilities. It could be a um, small server or it could even be a small appliance. So don't be afraid by the word advanced in there. It's, it's great capabilities, but it can also scale down to be a small system. 
one of the aspects I think um, from an operating company needs to be determined is when the DCNs are added to a process. Is this a process expansion? Is it replacing your existing equipment over time um, as it becomes obsolete? Um, if it's a process expansion, will it have its own HMI? This does not show the HMI in this photo, but in this image, but of course it can be added anywhere here. It can be run off the ACP or it could just be a, um, a machine that's a computer that's on the OCF. There's no limitations on that. Also, the data, as I said before, can be routed back and be shown on this existing operator console. Over time, as DCNs are added and, and applications, maybe level uh, three applications are added into the ACP, it may be appropriate or desired to have the OPAS side of this uh, hybrid system become the master, and that's where the operator consoles reside. But this can be done gradually. Um, and the goal of OPAF is not to create a big barrier, big bang for upgrades or rip and replace, but to let the system grow organically as needed and be able to do upgrades, rolling upgrades without having to say upgrade the HMI just because you want a new feature in the controller. So the decoupling of the software from the hardware and from the different nodes you see in the OPAF system is going to allow that flexibility. I think that's a, a big benefit Don Bertuziak mentioned earlier as far as a smoother upgrade path. And there'll be great savings in that, I think, from a, an operating uh, viewpoint. Now, if we look at modular systems, Julie, you, you mentioned the, the use of these, and, and this is a, um, a popular trend, and it's been going on for a number of years. In Germany, the Namor organization um, has come out with something called MTP, modular type package, because they see, even in the future, building plants, new plants, purely from modular systems. Um, you know, other parts of the world having skids packages come in, um, they can come in with all types of automation. Now, it's likely, maybe, uh, you know, initially um, that they'll remain as PLCs, but we envision that there'll be benefits for these um, modular process system companies to put a DCN or multiple DCNs onto their modular systems. And this way, there can be a standardized um, feature automation the, the um as multiple modular systems come into a plant they can then be integrated into a master um, opas system or as shown here they can be then integrated in through a gateway into the uh, existing legacy systems and over time as a you know system matures and grows it, as i said before it may flip over and so the opas system or modular systems can become the master part of that system. So we recognize this is a trend and we're working, um, OPAF is working with Namor to bring MTP into OPAF, into OPAS. And I think there's a lot of potential here for unifying these approaches. Now, Joy, I, I hope that answered your questions. Um, and just to kind of summarize some of these, OPAF does not see the industry in a big bang just one day in a digital switch adopting it and, and not using anything else. We expect it will be a gradual move over. There'll be new plants that use OPAS and there may be some rip and replace activities that do that, but also there'll be these gradually built systems that over time will, will then turn into an OPAS majority system. So there's ways, no matter what's right for an operating company, um, there's a way to start using OPAS. And, you know, item two here, what calls out is when you start looking at using OPAS products, make sure you have the certified products. What that will do is give you a level of assurance that these products will be interoperable, interchangeable, and meet the um, expectations of what OPAS is talking about. So, um, if there's something that's not certified, it may well work, but it won't, wouldn't have been tested to the um, rigorous certification requirements that um, OPAF is, to, is creating. 
And that on number three, you know, the initial installations, again, can be very small. And don't worry about that term advanced and advanced computing platform, because that can be very small or could even start off um, just as one of your existing servers serving a uh, dual row role. But it will be important to talk with system integrators. Um, OPAF does not expect end users to get all this separate equipment, get it together, and make it work. The system integrator role will bring experience and, and uh, capabilities to your organization. You may think of this as one of your, your local system integrators now or one of your, your global system integrators, but make sure they have some OPA experience. And the best way to do that is to make sure they belong to OPATH, involved and, and have people that um, you know have been involved in developing the OPATH standard. And so for end users, um, if you know if you've developed a small test system, training system, and you're wondering what to do, and you don't have the opportunity for a brand new system, I think there are a lot of options in for bringing in OPAS components as um, uh, incremental additions to existing systems, whether it's a replacing kind, whether it's an expansion, a small process expansion, or just adding in new monitoring capabilities. Um, there's lots of ways to get started, and they don't require a huge um, step at that point. So on the wrapping up this segment, we'll turn it over to Steve Smith and talk about life cycle benefits. And then he'll talk um, with Lewis about what um, what can be done, you know, over the life cycle of a system. Steve, are you, or Lewis, are you there? I am here. Steve, so, I think. Yeah, Steve, please. <laughs> well, thank you, Dave, and thank you, Louise. Uh, I am Steve Smith. I'm the manager of control system support at Eastman. And my entire 29-year tenure with Eastman has been focused on automation and control system implementation. And the organization that I currently lead is responsible for the daily support <clears throat> and enhancement of the control system installations at our largest manufacturing site, which is also our corporate headquarters in Kingsport, Tennessee. And as a global specialty materials company with really over 50 manufacturing sites around the world, Eastman has over 350 control system installations comprised of numerous brands and vintages containing over a half a million points of IO. So we're very much in the similar situation that Julie described herself being in as well. And at just our Kingsport site, which is where I'm based and have primary responsibility, we have 60 DCS systems from six different suppliers. And these 60 systems alone are comprised of over 20 different generations or vintages of these suppliers' offerings, ranging in age from newly installed to over 25 to 30 years old. And in the PLC arena, again, just at our Kingsport site, we have over 800 PLCs from 16 different suppliers consisting of over 40 different generations or vintages ranging in age from newly installed to over 30 to 35 years old, especially in terms of the installed technology. So really clearly, I think based on this landscape and footprint, life cycle support of these systems is a tremendous challenge for us. I mean, spare and replacement parts are truly becoming an absolute nightmare. And therefore, going forward, we're looking for greater interoperability, uh, modularity, and portability of, of system components and applications. And likewise, our system's reliability, both now and in the future, is of great concern due to this age and obsolescence. And three recent experiences of ours of entire system replacements and migrations, the, the rip and replace as we've called it, it's clear to us that, that this is not a viable strategy alone to successfully address the reliability and obsolescence of our automation fleet, given the significant cost and labor and time required by such an approach. 
And therefore, we are looking for alternatives to help address this ever-increasing problem for us. So, Luis, how does OPAS help to manage obsolescence? Great question. So, uh, let's paint the scenario that you uh, kind of are fully invested in, uh, or invested in OPAS, and you start to introduce this technology as uh, Dave had um, uh, described in his uh, answer to Julie, and now it's been uh, 10 years, and it's year 2030, and you've been using this, um, you know, approach in your uh, automation systems. So you might have systems that are already operating your plan using technology from different suppliers in this heterogeneous um, type of automation solution. But let's say you you face a challenge. One of the challenges you described, right? Let's say that you that you had bought a, a DCM from supplier X, and for different reasons, supplier X is no longer in the market, or they might have uh, come up with uh, you know uh, an, an, a new approach to resolve the 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 DCN <laughs> functionality that they provide. The as as long as the the interfaces and uh, are uh, as uh, has been defined in OPAS remain in place, you know, it's not, that shouldn't be a limitation for you, right? So let's say that, that over time, and in this uh, scenario, the supplier X decides to, that they're no longer in the market uh, for different reasons. And, you know, basically you, in, a current, in the current state, you will be left, you know, let's say basically on your own how to resolve that problem with uh, with this scenario what we're describing is you know what about you no longer having access to to product from supplier x but however supplier y provides uh, let's say uh, another dcm uh, that also you know basically have the same interfaces as we have defined in uh, or find in, in supplier x we also can host the applications the same way that you can, you know, do in your supplier X DCN. And so the idea here will be to replace the uh, the DCN uh, that was delivered by supplier X here and with the one available from supplier Y. And in that scenario, basically rehosting the application. So within with let's say without needing to have um, significant uh, capital expenditure to, ex to let's say, upgrade your complete automation system or to go through a major turnaround to, let's say, take off or take down uh, part of your plan or, or your complete operation to replace uh, the automation system, then you will be, in this case, Switching over from the DCN that by supplier Y, uh, by the DCN from supplier Y, uh, and, and you know removing the DCN by supplier X with the DCN by supplier Y, uh, rehosting the application, putting uh, putting the portability uh, uh, or exercising the portability of the, of the applications, and and then you know basically. Uh, continuing your, your activity. It will be, in a way, the way that we envision this and the way that Stennis con conceive, the idea will be to have these open interfaces and, and well-defined interfaces that, that allow for the interoperability of the components, regardless of the um, supplier brand, and basically to be able to rehost the applications as you will do on your uh, existing um, DCN, right? So that then minimizing the impact of the exchange of components um, in that situation. At the same time, you can also, and uh, uh, using this approach, uh, might even benefit from some enhanced functionality uh, that is not impacted by OPAS and the OPAS inter defined interfaces. And and that will also be a, a way in which you can keep your system current and and remove obsolescence without a major disruption of your process or major capital expenditure. Uh, I hope I have answered the question. 
and we you know i think that um, we can uh, we can uh, pro probably move into some of the uh, section summary and the next steps uh, to discuss and so uh, here you know definitely the the idea, obviously, that we have tried to illustrate with this example is that the open interfaces and the interoperability will enable this exchange or re uh, of replacement of components that, as you know, we have described in the case, right? So uh, the maintenance of removing of that obsolescence as the two kind of examples that we have tried to illustrate had limited impact on the process of availability. It's only impacting those components that are affected and this exchange of components uh, that are available from an open marketplace of suppliers uh, really reduces the risk of dependency on a single supplier th that can go out of you know out of business or my obsolete uh, given technology forcing the the end user in a particular case so this is one key element of hope of the forum is to enable this open marketplace open ecosystem as ron described in his uh, section at the beginning and last but not least again these open interfaces and the interoperability also facilitates the introduction of uh, technology refreshing without a major capital project which is a, another key value that we see in the in the forum so, uh, I guess with that should we uh, I guess we go to um, Mohan for Continuation here, I guess, right? So. Or, or maybe we, well, let's let's go to the conclusion of this part, and then we we bring Mohan, who is our master of ceremonies today, so we can uh, move to the next section. Uh, we only have a few minutes left, so you know what we have tried to illustrate and kind of a, to conclude on this section really is you know how to how we can gain experience with opens right so the that what we have show is really start small learn and grow once you have the confidence and the experience uh, that you have accumulated right um with that also seek those benefits right we have illustrated some life cycle benefits as to manage the obsolescence in a cost efficient way um you can also be growing with the opus approach right the start small as i mentioned before benefit from the gradual expansion based on your experience and needs uh, rather than starting a big band that might be expensive and uh, difficult to justify economically uh, then the open standard also uh, for existing facilities right so as dave mentioned work with your suppliers to, to start adding these opus products uh but it's important then to keep in mind you know how to expand what are your your goals that you're trying to achieve and then last but not least and probably the key here is this reliance on the open interfaces and interoperability uh, that is described in opus that facilitates introduction of technology and the technology refreshing without the complete replacement of an automation infrastructure as we have our experience in many cases today. So with that, I think that we should um, probably um, where we are. Uh, I don't know, Mohan, if you want to take it from here and, and explain how we're going to handle the next. Sure, um, Luis, thanks. Uh, and, and yeah, I thought that was a pretty informative session on sort of the end user perspectives and the idea that you can actually bring in um, OPAS, not as one big block, but gaining experience and then trying to, you know, deal with different types of issues and modular systems and integrating it into your existing facilities as well as managing obsolescence. Steve, I mean, I was uh, shocked when I heard the kind of things that you had to, uh, you have, the complexity and the diversity of systems that you have uh, in, in your operations. So I, I, I think it's truly something that uh, you know, the companies can benefit from. Okay, so what is your level of familiarity with Open Process Automation Forum? About a third of the respondents say it's high awareness and 20% uh, about medium awareness. 
and about a third um, who have, and about a half of them are going to be saying low awareness or none. Okay, great, thank you for that, okay. All right, and we, we hope the introduction was, um, was uh, useful. And what I would add is that we're working to make sure, uh, I know we had some audio difficulties uh, early on. So in the recorded session, we will correct the audio uh, discrepancies. Okay, so this next question was really about what is your role in the automation space? Who do you represent? So about 27% say they represent owner um, uh, operators, and um, about seven percent and about ten percent are so software uh, and hardware makers uh, ab about an eighth of the people are tcs suppliers and 15 percent describe themselves as system integrators and about a quarter of the participants are technical or professional consultants okay so and and uh, about 10 percent are other category okay all right, that, that was uh, helpful. Thank you. Uh, and and uh, we hope it is useful and, and uh, you know, for you and in getting your level of familiarity up and also thinking through how the adoption would uh, work. And, you know, be, be um, aware that this is the first of our kind of uh, adoption seminars. Of course, we would have liked to love to have done this face to face with you, but also I realized that we wouldn't have as many people in a face-to-face -face setting. So, you know, there is a, a positive and a negative to, to both of those uh, uh, cases. So, yeah, we, we'll work with uh, this and, and, you know, we will be running more of these and, and maybe hopefully in a time zone that is more friendly to you uh, as, as we start to put more of these together. Okay. So there is a question that's come in, Mohan. I don't know if you've spotted it. Um, saying that redundancy is a feature that today's DCS have. Is there redundancy in the DCN? Yeah, Mohan, I can, I can address that if you want. Sure. Yeah, so uh, if, you, if, the, if the questioner would allow me to repose the question from the perspective of the asset owner, what we really care about is availability and, and Redundancy in the spirit of the question is one way to achieve high availability. So uh, we need to be thinking about new technological capabilities that enable us to achieve high availability without necessarily uh, requiring physical redundancy. So what you'll see us working on uh, in the OPA forum and in, and in the OPAS standard itself is uh, uh, the incorporation, you know, by defining the interfaces for new types of technologies that allow us to achieve high availability and, and, and concepts like failover um, without uh, always requiring physical pairwise redundancy. So I, I could break the, the answer to the question down more precisely in terms of what you're capable of doing with I.O. versus what you're capable of doing uh, uh, with the software execution. So and where, it, where there's a physical thing that can fail, yeah, you probably still need, a, you probably still need a physical pairwise redundancy. But as soon as you move into the cyber domain where you're talking about uh, software execution functions. Uh, we're, we're definitely thinking about other solutions to the problem and the requirement for high availability without necessarily requiring physical pair-to-pair -pair redundancy. So that's the best answer I can give to the question. 